Cézanne inspired the most lauded artists of the 20th century, but he struggled for years to achieve anywhere near their levels of success. Cézanne is now, I think, heralded as the father of modernism. The young Matisse and the young Picasso um, fell in love with Cézanne's style. Today, one of Cézanne's paintings is rumored to have sold for the highest price in history. The painting is worth what someone will pay for it. 158.4 million pounds, which is astonishing. Another was stolen in a daring raid, only to be recovered in Serbia in 2012. Three men stormed into the gallery. One man had a gun and threatened the staff and the visitors, and the two others rushed upstairs and seized pictures from the wall. They just took the first things they could see, and they were lucky to run off with something that was such a, a tremendously important work. Cézanne isolated himself in later life, having been shunned by many critics, but adored by young up-and-coming artists. He was really working in an experimental manner, particularly in landscape painting. And back in Paris, other artists like Renoir, like Monet, were becoming fascinated to hear about what their once unruly friend was doing back alone down south. His work would have an important and very profound influence on the younger generation of artists. However, it was only after his death that his true legacy would finally be established. It's so fine and yet so terrible to stand in front of a blank canvas. Paul Cézanne was born in Aix-en-Provence on the 19th of January, 1839. Like most artists, Cézanne would soon be drawn to the bright lights of Paris, but it would be in Provence that he would create his greatest works. Cézanne's father was a banker, so he was relatively well off, and they had a fairly comfortable home and existence in Aix-en-Provence, where Paul was brought up. His father wanted him to study law, but he decided to be an artist. Nonetheless, his father supported him for many, many years. Unusually for a painter, I think, Cézanne came from immense privilege. He was a rich boy, not, not the typical um, background for most post-impressionist artists. Whilst growing up in Aix-en-Provence, Cézanne was close friends with Baptistin Bale, who had become a well-known physicist in Paris. Emile Zola, one of France's major literary figures, was also a school friend. The three of them became so close that they were known as the Three Inseparables. Amazingly, Emile Zola, one of the great writers of the second half of the 19th century in France, was Cézanne's closest boyhood friend. They grew up side by side, spent every day together exploring in and around X, and had an extremely close friendship. It's astonishing to have three such important people uh, together in this provincial school. Well, they were sort of like the three musketeers, really. They were just all really good buds together, and they were young, and I think they just had a ball. They were very close to begin with when they were in their 20s, but they did fall out later. Cézanne made his way to Paris in 1861, having been encouraged to do so by Émile Zola. His work was often mocked by other artists of the era, but he found encouragement throughout his artistic struggles with the support of Camille Pizarro. I too was an impressionist. I don't conceal the fact. Pizarro has an enormous influence on me. But I wanted to make out of impressionism something solid and lasting, like the art of the museums. He and Camille Pizarro met in the very early 1860s, both students of painting in Paris. They seem to have hit it off uh, right away. They seem to have very quickly made friends with other artists who would become the Impressionists. Pizarro was a few years older than him and initially played a rather fatherly role. And Cézanne was very much influenced by Pizarro's Impressionism. Cézanne famously didn't really kind of get on with Impressionism, but he did get on very well with, with Pissarro. And I think when he was young, Cézanne had, had decided to follow Delacroix 
And he painted these very kind of miserable, dark, tormented, um, dislikable paintings, really. Rapes and murders and blood and gore. And Pizarro, a painter of nature, took Cezanne under his wing and calmed him right down, got him to, to observe nature and to paint uh, nature in it with a steady eye. I think really Pizarro said, you know what, Paul, lighten up. I mean, literally, because he lightened up his palette. They went and painted en plein air, things that would remain in his practice for, for the rest of his life. I think they both really admired what the other was trying to do, and both of them acknowledged the other as a master, which is, is actually sort of poignant and, and impressive. The rise of the Impressionist painters was just beginning when Cézanne entered the art scene in Paris but he was always on the periphery of the movement. Cézanne met all of the artists whom we now think of as the Impressionists. He was one of them in terms of being a friend. Stylistically, they didn't at first think they had uh, much in common, though in 1874, when they organized the first Impressionist exhibition, they certainly invited Cézanne to join them. He was very much influenced by their style and the way that they were trying to capture uh, the effects of light, capture the atmosphere of landscape rather than the meticulous detail which painters had tr traditionally used. He got the opportunity to show in a couple of their exhibitions, but he wasn't really part of that band of brothers. He took things from it, but he felt that it was insubstantial, and so he tried to make it, as he said, more solid. He introduced sort of architecture to it, really. And if he'd started off looking back to Delacroix, he by the end of his life, he was looking very much at, at Poussin and about the kind of the geometric structure of Poussin's paintings and became very important with Cézanne. Everybody's going crazy over the Impressionists. But what art needs is a Poussin made over according to nature. And there you have it in a nutshell. Cézanne's submissions to the Paris Salon were continually rejected for years, and he found himself drawn back to the warmer climates of Provence, where he'd grown up. It was here that he found his quintessential style. Paris never really suited Cézanne. He was a bit of a loner. He was not very sociable, kind of gauche. Uh, going home again to the landscape that he knew and loved and now was free to spend all the time he wanted uh, painting uh, allowed him to get rid of worries about impressing other artists or impressing collectors and just focus on what he wanted to do as a painter. He was much more independent in Provence. He wasn't surrounded by the Paris art scene and the Impressionists. And Cézanne um, forged his own path, if you like, and developed his own style, which is his contribution. I think it becomes more refined, the palette gets lighter. He becomes completely wedded, really, to this idea of using red, yellow and blue using this method of painting in parallel dabs of paint that are structured on the canvas to reveal the shapes of the things that he's trying to depict. Brush strokes, um, areas of colour, really gave an atmosphere to his pictures, which is what makes him special. His father had died. He was living openly with his wife. It was a marriage the father never uh, approved of. He had inherited money, inherited uh, house, uh, and could really devote himself to nothing but painting. He says earlier he, he wants to make paintings that are going to be in museums, you know, so this is a high ambition. <laughs> Cézanne's painting of a hillside in Provence, now in the National Gallery in London, encapsulates the style that Cézanne was capturing with his many landscapes of the area. It would also become a highly influential work. Well, the painting depicts either a hillside, but maybe a quarry. We don't know exactly where. But what's special about it is the way that Cézanne painted it. Lots of small areas of colour, some of them reflecting on the stones of the rocks in the foreground and the fields in the background. This gives a sort of marvellous rhythm to the painting. So it's really Cézanne at its best. 
Hillside in Provence is one of those pictures where art historians, when they look at it in the faceting of the rock, in the way in which the composition is built up all on the surface, can begin to see the cubism that would come along 20 years later, the cubism of Picasso and Brock, this fragmenting of nature into brief moments of experience uh, would prove enormously influential. The world doesn't understand me, and I don't understand the world. And that's why I've withdrawn from it. In his later life, Cezanne had become ever more isolated as he was beset by breakdowns of his personal relationships and his own health. But he was wrong about the world failing to understand him. Young artists who would define the artistic landscape of the next century were determined to seek out and learn from this reclusive genius. Paul Cezanne spent most of his life in his hometown of Aix-en-Provence. The local community never really warmed to his artistic ambitions. But in 1895, Cezanne's reputation would gain a significant boost when the Parisian art dealer Ambroise Vollard gave him his first ever solo exhibition. Ambroise Vollard was a very interesting, complicated uh, man who uh, set himself up as an art dealer uh, around 1890. He spotted that the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists were doing something really important and that also that he could make money by selling their work. He genuinely seems to have wanted to make a mark and show work that was really breaking the mould, being different and being quite shocking. He gave Cezanne his first one-man exhibition in 1895. Cezanne was 56 or 57, you know, he, he really plugged away. I mean, you've got to give him full marks. Later on, he sold many of Cezanne's works, and in 1914, he published one of the first books on Cezanne. Vollard played a major role in bringing Cezanne before the art-loving public. At the same time as Cezanne's name was starting to grow in stature, the man himself was keen to remain as undisturbed as possible. He'd even broken off contact with his lifelong friend Emile Zola, who had also made quite a name for himself in Paris. Zola published a novel called L'Oeuvre, which uh, contained a character called Claude, who was obviously Cézanne, and also a, a hopelessly inadequate painter who ended up hanging himself in front of one of his own paintings. There's a letter to Zola that Cézanne writes that's saying, you know, I'm in receipt of the book, thank you very much. And that was the last time, really, that they had anything to do with each other. I think he was just terribly indiscreet, actually. And I mean, I think he saw it as rather a, a, a sympathetic thing, that, that, that Cézanne wasn't understood. It was just that it caught Cézanne. I think he was probably feeling that the world didn't love him anyway, and here it was being um, underlined by Zola. He didn't need it. Although when Zola died in 1902, Cezanne's gardener said that Cezanne locked himself in his room and howled with, with grief. So, you know, typical friendship. Despite his deliberate attempts to isolate himself from most of the world, many artists were drawn to the works he was creating in Provence. His renown is an interesting thing. Already by 1881, 82, uh, Renoir was going down to paint side by side with him in the south. Monet was inviting him to come up. They all seemed to realize that he was moving in uh, an extraordinary direction. Towards the end of his life, he did increasingly have an influence on the younger generation of artists, artists such as Matisse and Picasso. He came to the attention of the young, and they made pilgrimages down to the, you know, Jeanne de Buffon. He became an icon, really, of rebellion and youth the James Dean of post-Impressionism. The day is coming when a single carrot, freshly observed, will set off a revolution. Cezanne died in 1906 at the age of 67, having succumbed to pneumonia after being caught in a downpour whilst working in the countryside. A year after his passing, his works were exhibited in a retrospective in Paris at the Salon d'Automne. The art world would never be the same.
At that show, he had over 50 paintings, um, and they would have an important and very profound influence on the younger generation of artists who first saw his work in such quantities. It was seen as, uh, you know, one of those moments where everything changes, and it, and it did. I mean, I think he then was brought to the wider of attention of uh, the general public, but specifically to other artists. It actually, I think, did completely surprise people because they saw all the work gathered together in the same place at the same time. And there are contemporary accounts of it, of people being astonished. That small core of people who had admired him for a decade or more now, as it were, showed him to the wider world. And it's at that point that you see Cezanne's fame begin to spread beyond Paris around the world. Cezanne would soon be considered one of the key figures of post-impressionism. All the major galleries of the world started to acquire his paintings. We bought the painting in 1926, relatively late, uh, but using funds that Samuel Courtauld, the great industrialist, had given the National Gallery early in the 20s specifically to buy modern paintings. He felt we'd lag behind in that area. Here was a very nice sum of money, uh, and we uh, started to buy all the major uh, figures of French modernism, uh, beginning in the early 20s, finally coming around to Cezanne in 1925-26. Pablo Picasso was one of the new breed of artists that were particularly enamored with Cezanne, and it's thought that he referred to him as the father of us all. There's that rather kind of sterile thing about where does modernism begin in painting. Well, one of the places it begins certainly is with, is with Cezanne, because he changes a contract about really what a painting is. It no longer has a duty so much to portray or recapture an image or a feeling or a sensation or impression. It really kind of owns up to the fact that it's a painting. It says, well, you know, I could do it like this. They're all quite openly experimental. So it becomes painting about painting rather than painting about landscape. Picasso would go on to say that it was the difficulty. Looking at Cezanne's pictures, you saw an artist working through problems of picture making, and you could follow that process. Picasso found that absolutely fascinating. Cezanne became such a sought-after artist that it's thought that one of his paintings may have sold for the highest price ever, when the Qatari royal family purchased the card players in a private sale in 2012. These things are always very secret. Uh, it's not been confirmed, and it was said that the price was $250 million of that order, which might well make it the most expensive painting which has ever been sold. The reason that it was uh, so expensive was that the card players are seen as a sort of pivotal point in the canon of Western art history. Therefore, it's something that actually is priceless in a way, and so much has been written about it. Some individuals were able to get their hands on a Cezanne by even more secretive means when the boy in the red vest was stolen in Switzerland in 2008. It would be four years before the painting was recovered in Serbia. Cezanne's boy with, with a red vest was one of four important paintings which were stolen from the Berla Foundation in Zurich in 2008. This was a private collection which is open to the public. One Sunday afternoon, just before closure, three men stormed into the gallery. Um, one man had a gun and threatened the staff and the visitors, and the two others rushed upstairs and seized four important uh, Impressionist and post-Impressionist pictures from the wall, including the Cezanne. Well, it seems to be completely amateur and stole the first four pictures they could lay their hands on, which unfortunately for the Berlin collection happened to be a Cezanne, a, a Monet, a Degas and a Van Gogh. Boy with a Red Vest was um, recovered in Serbia in Belgrade um, four years later. There were plainclothes policemen who were pretending to buy the picture and then they seized it. Although they say oh, it was found in, in the boot of a car, the painting was slid between the lining of the top of the roof of the car and the, and the car roof, so in a small bit, and they, it was sort of like pulled out as if by magic it was found. I loved it that the man who'd stolen it was the man they caught was called Ivan. I mean, it'd have to be, you know, it was a real B-movie stuff, and the car was stuffed with dollar notes and guns. 
perfect. Yeah. It was a huge relief for everyone that one of Cezanne's greatest paintings was recovered undamaged. From his hideaway in Aix-en-Provence, Cezanne produced works that have exerted a remarkable power over the artists that followed him. And despite his attempt at isolation, he still left a blueprint for modern art. Monet and Renoir were fervent admirers. And then a new generation, Picasso, Brock, Matisse, discovered him and renewed the fascination within the avant-garde. He wanted to make paintings. He was very happy to be on his own doing that. He just excluded everything else. Artists fell in love with Cezanne's style, and it had a great influence on the art of the early 20th century. Although Cezanne initially inspired the avant-garde, he is now firmly established as one of the great masters of all time.